Oh my goodness, Lord, we thank you for the presence of your spirit. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Lord, let everything that, that takes place today, let it be done in order. Lord, let it be done in decency. But Father God, that you will speak to us by your spirit. The spirit of prophecy will be with us today, O oh God. Lord, as you reveal truth to us, as you, as you open the scriptures to us, O oh God, and that we may have understanding. And Father, I pray today, O oh God, Lord, that everyone who desires to be on today, that they would have the opportunity to be on, really, and share and be a part of this incredible task. And we give you the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, I want to welcome all of you who are on this um, this chat, this Zoom chat. We are studying. Okay, this is not a preaching session. We are doing the last teaching of School of the Prophets Part 2, which I took the opportunity to welcome, you know, as many people as possible. And the reason I did that uh, is because it's not directly in our books. And we would remember, um, some of us would remember our, our books here. So we have, you know, the School of the Prophets book here. Okay. and. Um, the, the last chapter in level two is identifying false prophets, okay? And while we would have spoken about the young prophet or the prophet and the, the young man and the old prophet, we would have spoken about that in First Kings chapter 13. We did not go in any detail concerning Balaam and Balak and Balak. And we have to understand that we cannot go any further in the understanding school of the prophets without knowing, you know, Balaam's error. So today we are going to discuss Balaam's error, and I'm going to do it in quite a, a lot of detail. I don't know if you were here, if, if everybody was here to remember uh, this concept of the idol because in understanding the the young prophet or the man of god and Bal balaam we have to understand the concept of of an idol okay and um i want to just pull up again for you to write if you don't have it already some of you would have would have it already so i'm just going to pull up the 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 white board here quickly um because I want, I want to be sure that you have this definition, okay? It's very important that you have it. In terms of a definition of an idol, okay? An idol is anything or anyone we devote ourselves to and receive complete happiness and security in more than the love of God. Okay? Now, uh, I have that up there. I, I want you to, to take that down because it's important that, to make sure you have that definition. I know I would have spoken about it before, but we need to be sure that everybody has that, has that definition going. All right? So today, we are going to look at Balaam. We're going to go into detail and we, de we are going to have, if you have your Bibles, we're going to, even though I'm going to pull it up, it's Numbers chapters 22 to 24. All right. So let's get back here. So are you there with me? All right. So let's, let's begin with uh, Numbers chapter 22. And I'm going to read for you verses 1 to 4. Are you there with me? 1 to 4. Okay. Now. Then the children of Israel 
moved and camped in the plains of Moab on the side of the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was exceedingly afraid of the people because there were many. And Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. So Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this company will lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at the time. Okay, so we are speaking now um, about the king of the Moabites. If you could just keep that up for me for a little while. Um, that's the king of the Moabites. Now, it says here, then the children of Israel moved. So Israel at that point of time was on a move. They had just completed almost 40 years of the exile. They reached about 30 years of, of being uh, in the wilderness. And they were now about to head to the promised land. And as they continued to, to reach to the, the promised land, remember, we are coming now into a place where they, they, they are now going to see unbelief again. There is so much unbelief. Okay, what was so interesting was just prior to chapter 22 in, in Numbers chapter, don't go to it, in Numbers chapter 21, they just experienced victory after victory after victory. They experienced victory from the, from the Canaanites in Numbers chapter 21 verses 1 to 3. They experienced victory after the Am Amorites, that's in uh, Numbers 21 verses 23 to 24, which was quite fantastic. I mean, if I could go into that, you know, um, we don't have time, but they experienced victory there. And then just before the end of 21, chapter 21, we see where under the Bashanites, they also experienced a victory. And that's in verse, verses 33 to 35. We're seeing that there. All right. But we come now to, a, to, to verses 1 to 4, and we see Moab being sick. Moab being, uh, you know, with dread because of the children of Israel. Why? Because the children of Israel were about to advance towards Moab and the king who was Balak, because our story is going to be much as much about Balak as it's going to be about Balaam. And so this guy called Balak, this king, was absolutely afraid. Why was he afraid? He was afraid simply because, because these people, these Israelites, were able to defeat almost every neighbor he had. And so he realized that there had to be some sort of favor that these Israelites had on why it is that they were defeating every single enemy around. Okay, because it says here that the company will lick up. Oh, we see that there? We said that it's going to lick up everything, lick up everything around as an ox licks up the grass of, of the field. They're going to destroy everything in, in the path. All right. Now, in one sense, when we are looking at that, Balak's fears was really logical, because if if the if you if some people destroy everybody around you, you are going to have fear. But there was another point here, because Balak should have understood that there was a prophetic word from before, and that they would have had some sort of protection. And the protection came, and some of us, not, not all of us would remember this, but if I could pull it up quickly, there was uh, in, in a scripture, if, if we pull up Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 9, if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 9, you, you write it down. Sorry. Deuteronomy chapter 2. Uh, verse 9, there's something you're going to see there. It says, Then the Lord said to me, Do not harass 
Haras, the word is Haras, Moab, nor contend with them in battle, for I will not give you any of their land as a possession, because I have given Ar to the descendants of Lot as a possession. And so back then, really, God did not intend for the people of God to really, you know, have Moab. And he should have remembered that. They should have remembered that. But, but it was not something that they remembered. Something else we have to note, and, and I want us to even note this down, because Balak, as was many kings of that time, believed the outcome of battles were determined by gods. Mm. So gods were in charge of every battle, okay? And so, so the fact that the Israelites were winning all the battles he believed that it was their God that was causing them to win the battles. And, and we, that is something we have to know. Uh, because when you see Balak Be is beginning to go to look to somebody called Balaam, yeah, the reason he went looking for Balaam was simply because he realized it had to have been something spiritual. It had to have been the God's and of course, they did not know, of course, it was, uh, it was one, the God, but the, for him, it was the gods, all right? And so we are continuing now here. And if we continue a little bit on verses, verses 5 and, and 6, let's go to verses 5 and 6 of Numbers chapter 22 quickly. So we are on numbers 22. Let's just do, we're doing it bit by bit here. Verses five and the six. Then he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor at Pithor, which is near the river. Please remember, I know I say this all the time, but if you see the river and the R with a capital R, always it is in reference to the euphrates river okay in the land of the sons of his people to call him saying look a people has come from egypt and remember they left egypt into the promised land see they cover the face of the earth now they didn't really literally cover the face of the earth but to him it appeared that because they were just defeating everyone in their path and are settling next to, to me. Oh. Therefore, please come at once. Yeah. Curse these people for me, for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and to drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. Now we have to understand there was something that Balak knew or there was something that they like understood as it pertains to the God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who come on as it pertains to his prophets, whomever the prophets bless is blessed, whomever the prophets curse is cursed. That was something he knew. And I want us to understand back in that time, not only was it Balak who knew it and understood it, but all the kings of the area knew and understood that, okay? So he sent messengers uh, to, to this guy who is now being introduced for the first time in the Bible, this, this guy called Balaam, who is the son of Beor at Pethor. Now, Balaam obviously was not an Israelite. He was from Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is near the Euphrates, right? And please understand, this is about 400 miles away. It would have taken a month's journey for Balaam even to get to where Balak was, okay? Now, as, this, as we continue with the account, it's clear here that, that Balaam has some sort of knowledge of the true and living God. He has some sort of knowledge of the God of, of Israel. He would have had to if Balak had some, uh, some knowledge of who he was, okay? 
And that is something we have to, we have to understand. Balak knew something about Balaam to the point where he could have called him. Therefore, he had a reputation. There was a reputation that he had, this guy called Balaam, all right? That Balak would have been able to call him, okay? Now, now we have to understand, it may not necessarily have been that ba Balaam had this intimate personal relationship with God. We know that in, in the Bible, there were people who did not have a personal inter, inter, in, uh, in relationships with God yet, God spoke through them. We know of, of, of Jethro. We know of Melchizedek. We know um, of King Cyrus. We know of people. They didn't really know God at the time, but yet God spoke through them. Amen? Now, there is something else. He says, therefore, please come at once and you know, curse these people for me. Sometimes saints unbelievers understand and believe more than believers come on you know how many people when things go really really wrong that they would call a prophet okay yet this guy this king bela knew something was about to happen that was not really good and so he summoned someone who was supposed to be representing the true and the living God, okay? And what did Balak want? He wanted Balaam to curse Israel, to, to destroy them, to cripple them to the point where, and to really get it spiritually. Now, he didn't want, it was not a physical destruction he was talking about. He's the son. He was dealing with it in the spiritual realm. Yes, this is a battle, but he was going through, how is it somebody who doesn't even know God understood that the battle had to be dealt with firstly in the spiritual realm? Wow. Yet he, Balak, understood in order for me to defeat these people, because apparently in the natural realm, it was not working. So let me try to defeat them in the spiritual realm. Okay, let me cut off, let me cut off the source of power. Yes, which would have been, which would have been their God. Let's destroy them through that realm. And so we find that uh, many of us don't really see it from that way. So we, we, we want to, we want to fight battles in the natural rather than going in the spirit realm. And we who are supposed to know God are supposed to know better when in fact, when in fact this, this, this king who doesn't know God was able to discern, listen, I need to deal with this in a different level. I need to deal with it in the spirit realm. Okay. So when we look at Balaam here, Balaam had a reputation, obviously, otherwise this king would not have approached him. He was known as this, this mighty man and it's so-called in spiritual things. Okay. So that he can actually have the ability to curse Come on, and to bless. This was the reputation this man Balaam had, and Balak identified with it. Okay, so now we are going to read verses 7 and verse, verse 8. So let's go down to verse 7 and 8 in, in, in uh, Numbers chapter 11. I hope you are there with me. Sorry. Numbers chapter 22, again, I'm repeating verse, verses 7 and 8. Okay, so let's see where we're at now. So it says here, So the elders of Moab and the elders of Amidian departed with the divinest fee in their hand, and they came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balaam. And he said to them, Lord, here tonight, and I will bring back a word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed in Balaam. Now stay there and you look at this scripture for a little while because they are speaking about something called a divine speak. Now, 
this is suggesting of uh, some sort of standard fee that is required for anybody who is called a prophet. Uh, it, it is not even an extra fee. It's not even something unusual. They understood that there was a fee that was given to anyone who they identified as a prophet. Now, please understand, the teaching we are doing today is identifying false prophets, okay? But they identified him as some sort of prophet who was given, as was, as was the custom, uh, the divinest fee, some sort of standard fee, right? That was supposed to be uh, given to this to this uh, so-called prophet called called Balaam. All right. Now he said here, he said lodge here tonight, lodge, and I'm gonna bring back word for you. Oh my goodness, lodge here tonight, and I'm gonna bring back word for you. T this is, and I want you to note it here. This is the first compromise. What do we what are we learning about Balaam in the fact that he possibly could be a false prophet because we are this we are discussing him in the chapter of false prophets? How is it that Balaam here is saying that I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stay here and I'm gonna bring back a word to you, okay? Now, that's his first compromise. When he invited the men to lodge there with him so that he can hear from God. Now, please understand that word God, the Lord is Adonai. That's the holy name of God, right? That he can hear from God regarding, you know, their offer. That's the first compromise. Saints, look at me, listen to me. The first compromise when we are finding ourselves engaged in a in a, a, a questionable environment with people or with someone is when we are hearing or choosing company or choosing to listen to somebody who should know better concerning a matter but is saying wait let me hear from god concerning this maybe Maybe this is not what the Lord really wants. Maybe the Lord wants, you know, something else concerning this. So let me, let me hear. And then you now, you, you are, you are a part of it. Since the problem with Balaam here, Balaam already knew the answer. He knew it's God's people. He knew the Israelites were God's people. He knew there was absolutely no need for him to listen to God concerning something. Some of us want to hear God concerning something that we already know the answer to. We already know the answer, but we are saying, let me pray and fast about it. Let me go to a prophet about it. Let me see if the prophet will say something different. Let me even, uh, uh, you know, journal about it. Maybe I'll get something different. Let me pray and fast about it. And maybe I'll get a different answer. And we already know the answer to the matter is have nothing to do with these people or have nothing to do with this man. Balaam should have immediately have nothing to do with these people. But guess what he said? He said, lodge here tonight and I will seek the Lord. It was clearly wrong then and it is clearly wrong now to seek a prophet for hire. It, it was wrong then since in Numbers chapter 22, and it is wrong now for us to seek out a prophet for hire. So I need to get some information from you, prophet. So I will pay you this, or I will give you this. And if I give you this, I want to get a particular answer from you. I want you to understand this is what was going on. And it was wrong then, and it is wrong today okay there's no there's no uh, uh, mincing words about it what was the problem with balaam so far we have not yet identified totally that he was a false prophet 
but we are seeing where there's the initiation of compromise. Okay, now, what are we seeing here? The heart of Balaam, and I want you to take note of these points that I'm making as I say it. The heart of Balaam is being revealed, okay? Even though Balaam would have obviously been to many known in the region as a somebody who exhibits spiritual gifts. Come on. Somebody who can hear God's voice. Okay. Yet he revealed himself to be not somebody with a true heart. Yet he revealed himself to be not somebody with a genuine heart. Not somebody who was seeking God's will but was seeking his own will in spite of the fact that he was one with spiritual gifts. Saint, I want us to understand something here. Because of the idol that was in Balaam's heart, which we will come to understand in the story, the idol was the love for money. Because of Balaam's passion, and the desire for money was so great. What he did was he tried to manipulate the environment. He tried to manipulate God himself to grant some sort of, oh my God, some sort of exception to the rule here. Maybe this time, Lord, I would be able to get what I want. I want money. It's what I want. And so permit me this time, Lord, to just, you know, listen to what they have to say. Let's, let, let's barter here. Let's trade a little bit. Let's see if we can negotiate a deal where, Lord, you will be in approval of what is going on here. What are we talking about? We are talking about one word. We are talking about compromise. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying here. We are talking about compromise. Can we, can we go on? Let's read uh, verses 9 to 12 in Numbers chapter 22. Verses 9 to 12. I hope you are there with me so far that you are understanding what I'm teaching. I'm trying to go as fast as possible, but, but yet not trying to avoid missing anything. Okay? Remember what we are really teaching here is Balaam's error. Balaam's error. Okay, now, then God came to Balaam and said, who are these men with you? Did God know who these men were? Surely he did. Did he not ask Adam in the Garden of Eden, where are you? Come on. Did he not know where Adam was? Surely he did. Verse 10. So Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Look, a people has come out of Egypt, and they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, You shall not. And I want you even though I'm not hearing you, I want you to audibly say in your home, wherever you are, not. You shall not go. Come on with them. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed. I want you to see that not. A big word. It's a big word. What is the word? The word is not. You shall not go and you shall not curse. Amen? So, so let, let's deal with this. It says, then God came to Balaam. Now, now that alone to me speaks volumes because God really did not have any obligation. God did not have to go to Balaam concerning any matter concerning this because Balaam already knew that that's God's people and God will not curse his own people, okay? Yet, yet God approached Balaam. Why? God approached Balaam 
you know, because of his mercy. Saints, God is merciful in all things. And so in his mercy, he approached to him and he said, I, I, I need, I need, okay, I have it here. It's all right. He approached him and he said, who are these men with you? So God begins to, God begins to question. He begins to question Balaam. Who are these people that you are engaging conversation with? I'm here to ask you, who is it? that you are finding yourself engaging conversations with people who you should not be. If they are pulling down the pastor, if they are pulling down the leaders around you, come on, if they are, if they are planning schemes, who is it that you are finding yourself communicating with and, and so, and, and, you know, and, and finding fellowship because they lodged with him. Come on. You know, and, and so who are these men? Of course, God knew the answer to who these men were. And, and he asked Balaam because guess why he didn't, he asked Balaam. One of the reasons he asked Balaam was because Balaam in the natural did not really know who these men were. Listen, no, prophets don't know everything, saints. Okay. And even though we are looking at him, uh, so far to wonder if it was a false prophet. Remember, we have not yet come to any conclusion. We are saying Balaam did not really know who he was, who these men were yet. What he did know was the fact that what they had been asking him was evil. And so therefore he should have had nothing to do with them. You shall not go with them. You shall not curse them very specific crystal clear don't go don't curse amen now let's let us move on let us move on a little bit because because we when we read when we read when we read verse 11 a people has come out of egypt they have covered the face of the earth all of that all of that that we are seeing here we are seeing literally it is, it is the fact that Balaam already knew these people. They are God's people. But is it something more? You see, you see, saints. Is it that because he already knew these people, did he also have something in his heart concerning them? Was this just a case of, I just want money from this king? This king is here. I can, I can get as much as i want out of him or was it more than that was it a case of i myself don't like these people saints we've got to get into the root cause of the motive of Balaam in this teaching 13 to 15 let's go on we're going uh to numbers Chapter 22, we are going verses 13 to 15. I hope you are there with me. I hope you are understanding. I hope you are enjoying. 13 to 15. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, go back to your land for the Lord has refused to give me permission to go with you. And you would have put a thumbs up for Balaam at that point. And the princes of Moab rose and went to Balaam and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Then Balaam again sent princes more numerous and more honorable than the ones he had previously, than, than, than or, or more, another word from honorable is more distinguished. So apparently, Balaam has a thing with uh, people who are distinguished. Come on, remember, uh, you know, it's, it's going to the root cause of the heart of Balaam. You know, you know, if we, you know, Balaam is dealing with a king and he kind of likes dealing with the king, he doesn't like to deal with the plebs. So the first group of people 
that Balak sent, you know, no, he's too big. I'm a very well-known kid. I'm a very well-known prophet. And so I don't have to speak to these people. And, and some of us, some of us may know, you know, international prophets, you may know of them and understand that they don't speak, they don't speak to any and everybody. And so, no, 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 I'm not going to just speak to the plebs. You know, I'm going to, I, I, there are certain people that I will communicate with, but there are some people I will not communicate with. You know, you know, I'm not going to speak to the pastors who only have, you know, 25, 50, 100 people. No, no, no. I will only go to churches where there are thousands and thousands of people. Of course, come on, there we go. So uh, I'm just dealing with, just dealing with issues of the heart of the so-called prophet. Was he a true prophet? Or was he a false prophet? Come on, we are being trained in prophecy. Amen? So we are seeing that the Lord refused to give him permission. God says, no, you are not to go. And Balaam gave the exact statement. Balaam says, no, you cannot go. So what is it? What, is, what are we seeing here? We are seeing the fact that Balaam said, now, 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 can I, can I get it back here? Verse, verse, um, 13, Balaam, Balaam said, could you, could you pull it up for me, please? Right. Balaam rose in the morning and said, go back to your land for the Lord, hold on, for the Lord has refused to give me permission. <laughs> you ever, you know, you know, he could have said, I am not going. I, he did not have to say the Lord has refused to give me permission. He could, he could have said immediately, no, let me tell you something. I'm not, I'm not going anywhere with you. It was unnecessary for him to say the Lord has refused to give me permission yet. He deliberately says, the Lord, why would he say that? It is almost as though Balaam is blaming God. Who? It is almost as though he's, a, he's accusing God, come on, of, of, of insisting that he cannot go with them. You know, so he says, no, God wouldn't let me go. Yeah? You know, it, it's, it's, it's saying, it's, it speaks volumes here. Because we have to, we have to, we have to look at what's going on here. He could have said easily, no, I can't go. But he says, no, it's God. God doesn't want me to go. God doesn't want me to go. So because God doesn't want me to go, I can't go. So, you know, you know what it's like? It's like teenagers. Huh. You know, it's, it's teenagers, you know, when they want to go to their party or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and they have to tell, and the parents said no. And so they have to tell their friend, instead of telling their friend, no, I am not going, come on, I'm not going to that party, that's not my thing at all, no. Instead, they tell their friend to save face, they tell their friend, no, my parent, my father is not permitting me to go. Come on, what does that say? It says that they want to go. Not so? It says that they want to go, but they, but, but they, they cast the blame on their parent rather than how they feel, the conviction that's in their own heart concerning the matter. Are you seeing what I'm saying, right? So, <laughs> so, so Balak now, so because of that, guess what Balak, into, see, Balak was no fool. See, sometimes we read this and we're not, we're not thinking, we're not thinking, but Balak was no fool. Balak was able to see through this already. So what does he do? He sent princes, that were more honorable, that were more numerable, that were more distinguished than the previous ones. He already did, saw Balaam's heart. Yeah, Balak was no fool. He already saw Balaam's heart. Okay? And, and, and so, so, so let's go on. <laughs> uh, 16 to 17. Are we there with me? Let's go. Let's try to go. Let's see how fast we can go here. Verses 16 and 17. We are going along nicely. And 17. Right. So, and they came to Balaam and said to him, 
Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, please let nothing hinder you. Now you're hearing how it's going. Please let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will certainly honor, whoo, I will certainly honor you greatly, and I will do whatever you say to me. Therefore, please come, curse these people for me. Now the conversation is getting stronger. I don't know if you're understanding what I'm saying. I will certainly honor you. No longer is it carrying a diviner's feet. Remember before he was just getting what was standard, what was expected of him. We are going now beyond what was expected. He said, I'm not just going to give you, you know, what you're supposed to get. I'm going to give you much more than what you are supposed to get. Listen, I'm going to even give you riches. He says, whatever. I'm going to honor you greatly. Great honor will come your way. Oh my goodness. And that is just doing Balaam. Oh my goodness. Balaam is now going in a different day. Balaam is just like freaking out at this point. Please come and curse these people. So even though Balaam refused to, you know, uh, you know, he said he refused in the first set. Now the temptation is getting stronger. Are you understanding where I'm going here? The temptation is getting stronger. When we read verse 18 and 19, we're going to see something very different. Let's see what's going on now in verse 18. I hope you're there with me. I hope you're understanding uh, what is being taught here. Um, and not just applying it as a teaching for general knowledge, but applying it even to your own life. Amen? Now, then Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord, my God, to do less or more. Now, therefore, please, you also stay here tonight. <laughs> you also stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say. Saints, now we get it. This is what was on the heart of Balaam all the time. This was the issue. This was his idol. All the time we were kind of speculating as to what really was going on with Balaam, why the little pseudo-compromise was taking place. Now it's not a pseudo-compromise. It's now playing out in the air. Balaam cannot hold back anymore. He goes with a negative positive. He says, though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold. What did he say there? His idol. In other words, he literally threw it out as bait. Remember the young prophet with, with, the, uh, with the young man of God, with the old prophet, right? You remember that story with the king? Yeah. And, and so we saw, we see in a similar case here where his heart condition, his heart issues became manifest. His idol was his love for material things, for money. Since that was, that was the whole thing. We, we can imagine the very voice of Balaam. He, we can imagine though, and he's saying it like, though Balak were to give me his house full with gold and silver, you know, he's going that way. I couldn't go beyond the word of the Lord, my God. I want you to understand. He's not, he, in, he is speaking about Adonai. That's who he's speaking about. And we have to understand, saints, compromise is what we are reading here has god not already spoken god has already spoken over the matter he, and, and now now god is going to begin to speak out of the idol of balaam's heart because god has already said what he had to say since when we continue in our prayer of petition to God, 
concerning a matter when God has already spoken about the matter, what begins to happen is that God will speak. No, 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 please get it. He will speak, but he will speak out of the idol of our own heart. Amen? And that is the dangerous part. Okay? Let's, let's, let's go on. And let me say this to you. If I didn't say this to you, the class before, and I, I want to repeat if I didn't, I'm not too sure, okay? The thing that you keep repeating, because that's what we're going to find out in this story, yeah? the thing that you keep repeating will be that idol in your own heart. If you are speaking over and over and over about a matter, a thing, or a person, understand it will be that idol in your heart. If we're not talking about, of course, I'm not speaking about the word of God. And Come on. I'm speaking about, I'm speaking about somebody over and over and over. I'm speaking about this matter, this job, this business, this whatever. I'm speaking about my finances. I'm speaking about my health. I'm sick all the time. I can't pay these bills. If we're continuously dealing with that, we are actually understanding that that is an idol. He says, he says in uh, verse 19, Stay here tonight. Stay here. Imagine after God spoke. Balaam tells them, look, look, you know what? Y'all stay here tonight. Because God might say some more things. Never mind the fact that God has already said what he had to say. He invited them to stay once more. Are you there with me? This is proof that Balaam continued to entertain sin. Sin, sometimes we entertain sin. And it's, you know, it's something to entertain sin once and then you repent and you move away and you go along. But it's another thing to entertain sin over and over and over, even though God has already spoken over the matter. Okay? There was no need for Balaam to seek God. There was no need for him to go before God concerning any matter, concerning anything. It, it was already spoken. Amen? Now, uh, let, let me see. Let me, let, let's go on to verse, verse 20 and 21 because there's, there's some things we want to get through with here. Right, 20 and 21. There we go. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, Are you there? Did you read that? God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men come to call you, rise and go with them. But only the words which I speak to you that you shall do. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went, and went with the princes of Moab. All the time he was no being God. <laughs> but finally, he listens to God. And he says, okay, come on, get up. Let's go. Let's go with the princes. We got to obey God concerning this matter. I want us to understand that God was responding out of the idol of Balaam's heart. When we read Ezekiel chapter 14, and I want you to just note it, I'm not going to turn to it because, of, because it will take too long in this study today. But please note Ezekiel you know, chapter 14. Because Ezekiel chapter 14 speaks about elders who set up idols in their heart. Right? They, to, to love something, to love somebody more than God. That's what Ezekiel 14, you know, speaks about. And so we are coming here and we are seeing here where God simply responded. 
out of the idol of Balaam's heart. God did not change his mind at no point. And I want us to remember that because we already studied the fact that God does not change his mind. We change our mind and believe it's God. God did not change his mind. God had already said his perfect will. He already said it. He made it absolutely clear. This is what I will. This is my will concerning the matter. Balaam would not listen to the will of God. That's what's the problem. So what does, so what does God do? God says, okay, you don't want to listen to my word. You don't want to listen to my will. I'm going to speak to you now out of the carnality of your own heart because you apparently have to learn a lesson. There's some things you have not been learning. Now you have to learn a lesson. I'm going to teach you a lesson. I want us to understand, some of us, we have got to get it right. Because if we don't listen to God concerning a matter, I don't know why I'm going to say this, but I, I feel to say this now. Some of us have been told that we are to move from uh, you know, a particular job or a particular position or we are to move from a, a particular ministry or we are to, I don't know. God would, we know God had spoken to our heart concerning something, concerning the, the word change God had spoken. And yet we justify and we act and we say, no, God, you know, maybe no, Lord, maybe this is what, this is not what it is. Maybe, maybe I'm not hearing properly, Lord. And then we, and we get a dream and the dream is just confirmation on what God had said. And yet still we are coming back again and again and we are asking the Lord over and over. And then this is what God does. God says, you're not listening to me. So you know what? I'm going to answer you now out of the idol of your own heart. And you will think now that you're in my perfect will. I, I have known people to leave ministries that they should not have left. They should have been in that ministry because God was doing a work in them. But they left the ministry simply because of an idol in their own heart. I know people who were supposed to leave a ministry and go somewhere else, but they chose to stay because of an idol in their own heart. And, and, this, and this is where I'm saying is, we have to listen to God. The Balaam's problem, and, and, and this is where we're going, Balaam's problem was that he couldn't hear from God. He couldn't hear, we couldn't obey, sorry, what God was saying, okay? God did not change his heart concerning the matter, right? Now, Balaam arose in the morning. Did you see that? Balaam arose. Balaam woke up at the break of dawn. He could not wait to do the wrong thing. He was so excited that God told him, God gave him the go. God gave him the green light. And he was like, I'm waiting for God to tell me to do this. I'm waiting for God to say, okay, go ahead. I can do this. And now that I've provoked and I've pressed God and I've pressed God enough, God says, yes, yes. Now I could go. So he wakes up early in the morning and he says, God is going to bless me. Now I'm going to receive the blessing of the Lord. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Balaam already forgot that God had already said no concerning the matter. Okay? He was not interested anymore with the no. He wanted to hear the yes. So let's go to verses 22 to 27. We are dealing now with the donkey. So now we are coming to a, a, a time where saints, where Balaam, who was supposed to be one to hear God's voice, apparently refused to hear God's voice and God had to speak to him through a donkey. Come on. What does the donkey represent? Anybody want to take a note and put it in your in the little uh, 
what do you call it? In the box there. Before we before I you know finish. If you want to write there, what does the donkey represent? I want you to I want you to answer that question for me. What does this donkey that we are coming to? Because Balaam is going to have this encounter with this donkey, with his angel. What does the donkey himself represent? Okay, you you write it down. Write it down there for me, please. And and you tell me what the donkey represents. Right? So we're going to we're going to read it. And then I'm going to, I'm going to listen to your, to your answers. What does the donkey represent? Okay. So let's read. Then God, then God's anger was aroused because he went. Did you hear that? Did God not tell him to go? He said, he said, arise and go with them. But only speak what I tell you to speak. And the next verse, then God's anger was aroused because he actually went. Saints, I don't know if you're hearing this. God actually told Balaam to go. And then after Balaam obeyed that instruction, God got angry because he listened to that instruction are you there with me i want you to understand that if we continue in a prayer that god has already spoken to us about god has already given the answer for <laughs> and we provoke him again but god but god but god am i really hearing your voice god is there not something else let me seek out a prophet actually let me be a prophet and so i'll give this prophet some mangoes I'll give, I'll give this, I'll, I'll make some oil down for the prophet. I'll give this prophet something. And if I give this prophet, maybe the prophet will be able to speak to me the things that I want to hear. And let me tell you this, the prophet will. And it's, that may not be a false prophet, but the prophet will be compelled. Sunecho, the prophet will be compelled to speak according to what the Lord wants him to say, which will be out of the idol of your own heart. And it will be a sad thing because there are times when the prophet will know it's not God's perfect will, but the prophet will have to say it because you need to learn a lesson. You have not obeyed the voice of God when God speaks. You know, when we are teaching children, little ones, babies, infants, toddlers, when we are teaching toddlers, we are supposed to teach toddlers from the ages one to five. We are supposed to teach them first time obedience. Come on, first time obedience. In other words, when the child, when the infant touches something and they're not supposed to touch it, we give them, no, no, don't touch. And we, and we tell them they are not to touch and we expect them to obey first, the first time. It should not be, well, you know, I'm telling you, this is the third time I'm telling you this. This is the fourth time I'm telling you this. No, we are, that's not, that's not good, good, you know, parenting. We are supposed to expect our children the first time we tell them that they are supposed to obey. It is the same with the Lord. So when we keep going and going and going with God, God says, I'm going to tell you an answer. But the answer that I'm going to tell you, it's going to be out of, out of the carnality of your own mind and your own heart, your own idols, and not what, is, not what I really will for you. Come on. Amen? Then God's anger was, or, oh, we have some answers here. Right, so we are seeing, oh, what was the role of the, this donkey, uh, stubbornness, uh, rebellion, then I'm saying, um, a channel through which God speaks, uh, foolish things of the world, stubbornness, vanity, um, the world will judge you. Somebody else says stubborn, foolish, stubbornness, 
The donkey will represent the idol of our heart stubbornness. The unbeliever will show us up. Very good, Krishna. Very good answer, um, you know, Krishna. Since I want you to get deeper, uh, Krishna, you went deeper for me. Thank you. I want us to go deeper than what we... Okay, so let me put it to you this way. Whatever you think is the immediate answer, let's go beyond that. Amen? Because we are not going on the surface here. We are going deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay, in the understanding of the, of the donkey. So let's read it and then I will tell you what really this donkey actually represents. Let's read it quickly. Then God's anger was aroused because he went and the angel of the Lord took his stand on the way as an adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey and his two servants were with him. Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road. And the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn, either to the right hand or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam's anger was aroused and he struck the donkey with his staff. Do we see some more answers here? God will use the foolish things to, to correct us. Yes, good answer. The mercy of God, commander of the Lord, humility. Okay, uh, very good. But, but, but let's look at this. Um, God's anger was aroused when he went. And, you know, some might think, but that's just unfair. God, come on. You told Balaam to go. How could you get angry after he went? But we have to understand that Balaam only went because he had first rejected the voice of God. He rejected the clear command of God. And he even rejected his own conscience concerning, uh, concerning the matter because he knew that was God's people. So God should have been angry concerning it. And then it says, the donkey saw the angel of the Lord. Here's the point. The fact that the donkey, an animal, saw the angel of the Lord, the donkey represented stepping out of the carnal realm and into the supernatural. Let me ask you, can a donkey speak? Come on, can a donkey speak? Donkeys can't speak. And Balaam knew that donkeys can't speak. So what God did is that God caused Balaam because the natural realm was not working. God caused Balaam to enter into a realm of the supernatural for correction or rebuke. Oh, you didn't hear what I'm saying. Let me just take it. Let me, let me do this. This one. This one. Some of us are in a realm or a place where the idea of correction or rebuke, it's just not working with us. We're not hearing it from God. We are not, we are not discerning. We could be in church. We're hearing words from our pastors, uh, you know, prophets speaking to us, whatever. But we are not receiving it as actual correction. We're just receiving it as good word. We listen to a message. Oh, that's a good word, pastor. That's a good word, prophet. Come on. And we say, oh, it's a good word. But we are not literally taking it 
as, you know, as, as correction that will cause me to turn around my way or change my way that will have me box in from the left and to the right so that I can't go in any other direction but I have to go into the direction of the highway of holiness. And in the natural, sometimes it's not working. So what God does, as he did with Paul the apostle, what did he do when he was Saul? Come on, on the Damascus road. Come on, he knocked him down. He caused Saul to enter into the supernatural. And it was the supernatural that convicted him and blinded his natural eyes that his spiritual eyes would be opened in the case of a Balaam here god caused a supernatural event to take place the, the donkey symbolized the supernatural for Balaam to say oh my god this is a donkey speaking to me I think I need to step back here and I need to listen. Come on, are you there with me? Are you there with me? Yes. Yes. Amen. Okay, now. So the prophet, the prophet had amazing gifts. He had supernatural gifts. That's all. He was operating in the so-called supernatural, hearing the voice of God. However, however, because of his disobedient heart, he was unable to step into the supernatural realm of God. He was in another supernatural realm. Do you know there is a demonic supernatural realm? And there is a godly supernatural realm. He was operating out of the carnality of his own mind, speaking and even prophesying. I want us to listen carefully because even though the initial prophetic word that was given was actually an accurate word, it was not a word from God. And I'm going to show you this. It was an accurate word, but it was not out of the supernatural realm of God. It was just a gift that he was given because of his disobedient heart, because of the disobedient walk with God. He was unable even to see where God was taking him. God went beyond now. He says, I'm now taking you and causing you to step into a realm of my supernatural for you to now hear me and to hear me through a donkey. The donkey turned aside out of the way. The donkey responded to the angel of the Lord. Saints, the donkey responded. The donkey turned one way, then the donkey turned another way. The donkey avoided the judgment of God. The donkey understood what to do to avoid God's judgment. The donkey represented not just the supernatural, but something else the donkey also represented the simple obedient follower of god oh, you didn't feel like yourself. prophet are you saying that i'm a donkey well could i say something to us it was a donkey who carried jesus come on and I'm not speaking about the very animal of the donkey. I'm speaking about what the donkey represented. The donkey here, because of the obedience, you realize the donkey was able to step into the supernatural. The donkey was able to see 
pre-incarnate Christ because that angel of the Lord was no ordinary angel. That angel of the Lord represented pre-incarnate Christ. The donkey was able to see pre-incarnate Christ. He was able to see the supernatural. He didn't have all the airs about him. No, he didn't want to, he didn't need, you know, or, you know, to be with the who's of who of society. No, the donkey was just a simple, obedient uh, follower, represented a simple, obedient follower of Jesus Christ. And that's what we have to get from this donkey. And, and let me tell you, it was Balaam who beat the donkey. Do you hear that? Sometimes when we are a simple, obedient follower of Jesus Christ, we get licking, we get a licking from those who are the who's of who in the church. Those who believe they are of certain positions. And we get a licking for it because of the fact that our heart is not into confusion, because of the fact our heart is not into, into you know, speaking against the pastor, you know, the prophet. We are not into confusion. We are not into gossip. We, we don't want to be a part of that. And so we just want to serve the Lord. That's all we desire. So, Father, if it is that I have to be likened unto a donkey, so be it that I can see you, that I can behold you in the supernatural. Because what had happened is Balaam, with all his big talk, with all his giftings, was unable to experience the supernatural realm of God. He was unable. Are you there with me? Come on. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she laid down under Balaam. Since Balaam did not even see what the donkey was doing. Balaam did not see. Even there, there was a protection. You know what I, you know what I love about this particular passage? Was the, was the story of, uh, you know, the sword, the irony of it, the irony was, was that Balaam had the sword to beat the donkey when the angel of the Lord had a sword. Did we see that? The angel of the Lord had a sword. Yes? And, the, and, the, and Balaam had a sword to beat the donkey. The irony is, the angel of the Lord had the true sword for the true purpose. The sword was symbolic of the word of God. Amen. Balaam had the opportunity once again to apply the word of God to a situation, but instead he wanted to use a natural weapon. Rather than Karabuski, he wanted to use a natural weapon from the one that God was using to speak through him. How many of us want to use our tongue to speak against the messenger, the person who is just giving the message of God? Come on. And I want to pull this one down and I want to pull that one down. They're speaking my business. They, you know, they're coming, they're coming up against me and, and, and we are using our tongue as the sword in the natural when instead the, the very angel of the Lord used the sword, come on, the weapon of the word of God that Balaam himself still could not see. That's where we're going. Are you there with me? He said uh, in verse 29, Balaam said to the donkey, because you have mocked me, because you have abused me, I wish there was sword in my hand because I will kill you. He wanted a weapon that was carnal. Unfortunately, many of us are using the carnal weapon of our tongue in this season. And we have been likened unto Balaam. And so that is something that we have to renounce right now. Come on. We have to renounce it right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
let me say this to you and I, I can I maybe I could write this down let me put it as a note for you let me put it there in the whiteboard okay and I'm, let me write this for you and, and I want you to write it down prophetic insight can be blinded by the prospect personal gain when we speak about prophetic insight we are speaking about success prophetic insight according to uh, joshua chapter 1 verse 8 speaks of success so prophetic insight can be blinded by the prospect of personal gain and i'm speaking to those of us who have a prophetic insight those of us who are in that place where we hear from god we see things we get visions we get dreams but it can absolutely be blinded when we are finding ourselves with an opportunity to have personal gain if you are getting a personal reward if the reward is more important come on then you are going to find yourself being blinded by prophetic in, in, in prophetic insights you, know, you are not going to have it in other words as a matter of fact let me go further to say you are going to have some sort of insight but it's not going to be from god oh prophet i had this dream prophet i had this vision that i'm going to do this and i'm going to do that but if your motive, if the motive in everything that you are doing, it's just for personal gain. If everything that you are thinking about, it's just for a personal reward or personal exaltation, then I'm afraid what is going to happen is that you are going to uh, see in a realm that is not out from, from, seen from a realm that is not God's. It's not a godly realm. Because everything that we do must be to give God honor and glory. If it is not giving him honor and glory, if it is for our gain, but prophet, I need a house, prophet, I need a car, prophet, I need this, I need, if it is for just personal gain, if that's just your focus, it is that's okay in the world. But when we come to Christ, our focus our mindset must be absolutely different the problem with balaam the problem with balaam was the fact that his mindset was just on himself and the promotion of himself in whatever way in whatever way i get to i get to you know uh, communicate with kings and leaders you know so let's 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 go to verse 28 to 30. Twenty-eight to thirty. And it says here, and the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, because you have abused me, I wish there was a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. So the donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey on which you have ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever disposed to do this to you? Uh, and he said, no, come on, come on. Did I ever, did I ever uh, treat you in a bad way? Did I ever treat you negative? Come on, are you there with me? Oh, come on, Am I not, have I not always been there for you? Come on, the simple believer, the simple leader, the simple, the simple congregation member, was I not always there for you? How is it that you are treating me, you know, in this way? The, 
the Lord opened the mouth, mouth of the donkey. This realm of the supernatural became apparent. And even in the realm of the supernatural, Balaam still exhibited spiritual blindness. Balaam said to the donkey, Balaam speaking back to a donkey is insane. I don't know if you're understanding what I'm saying to you. It is insane. Who speaks back to a donkey? And is the fact that he was speaking back to a donkey simply meant that he was spiritually blind. He could not even identify with the fact that it was God just dealing with a matter in his heart. God just wanting to correct him here. He was so angry. He just didn't even hesitate. He just went back and spoke back to the donkey. And the fact that he will say that I wanted to kill you spoke what sense? It spoke the, of the carnality of the heart of the, of the so-called prophet Balaam. You know, eventually what's in our heart will eventually come out. And so he was aggressive to the innocent donkey. How many of us have experienced aggression from people with those who are innocent? Come on, saints, are we not dealing with this right now globally even? Okay, so we are seeing the carnality of Balaam. He was, he was, he, his carnality became manifest right now through this donkey. Okay, let's go to 31 to 33. Right. And the, then the Lord appeared, opened Balaam's eyes. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. I want you to listen to this. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you because your way is perverse. Come on, it's contrary. That word perverse actually means contrary before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside from me. These three times, that's the angel of the Lord speaking. If she had not turned aside from me, surely I would also have killed you by now and let her live. Oh my goodness. God would have saved the donkey and kill the so-called prophet, the mighty man of God that was summoned by a king. Come on. Why? You see, saints, the angel of the Lord standing in his way drew his sword. What does that mean? Don't go. Will you please, at this point, can you please turn back? Even, even though you've reached this far, even though you, you, you're going down this path, don't go any further. Don't go. I'm going to draw my sword. How many of you remember the drawing of the sword of an angel? Yes? You, re you remember that? Don't go any, any further. Don't go any further. Go back to where you were from before. Did I not speak to you before to, and told you not to go there? Because your way is perverse. Your way is not. It is carnal. It is contrary. Anybody, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, um, I don't know, it's, 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 it's uh, 757. Anybody here, you want to take a 10 minute break or you want to just go through and let us finish? Uh, you just let me know quickly if you're okay with, with completing to the end or if you, if you want to break. I, I just, I just need, actually, you know, probably I should just drink some water. I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah, Balaam is, you could just message it. Messages are on the chat. Or you could yeah, speak, you could yeah, speak. Yeah, I won't say nothing. I don't know if I don't talk or anybody wants to. What you're saying? Whatever the rest want to do. Whatever the rest want. All right. What, in your opinion, two questions, okay? What, in your opinion, was Balaam's error? That's one. What, in your opinion, was Balaam's error? And the second question is, what is this doctrine of Balaam? Okay, that's two. <laughs> what, is, 
what is the doctrine of Balaam and what was Balaam's error? By the way, I just gave you a little test. And I want us to always remember when I'm speaking, I'm always testing as the Lord does with us. Okay. I'm testing. And, uh, you know, I would have loved to see everybody's faces. You know, I wish, I wish you guys had put on the video, you know, that I could have seen your faces. It's okay. You know, no makeup, makeup. It's okay. Tie your hair up, whatever. You know, come on. I'm seeing Eva. Come on, everybody. Jackie, everybody, come on. You know, it's good to see faces. You know, it's it's important. Um, Sean Lee, everybody. Yeah, man. There, that's it, Eleanor. Good to see everybody. Lily. Yeah, Eleanor, you're wearing a youth fires jersey. Yeah, Jesse is real happy about that. Ariel, Cindy. Good, uh, uh, Mr. Lee, good to see you, Lucinda, very good. You see, it's good to see the faces, you know, I want to see the, the class of the people. Andy, where are you? Come on, let me see Andy, come on. You know, it's good to see you, you know. Um, it's important, uh, you know, to, for me to see the faces. Where's my husband? Can I see him? Is he around? You know, um, Hannah, you know, is, is Barry around? Is Barry had to work today? The, the, probably Barry's working today. I'm not sure. Amen. Okay. So those are the two questions. Think about it. Note it in your in your in your notebook because we're going to come back to get that answer. Okay. What, in your opinion, is the doctrine of Balaam, and what was Balaam's error? Two questions. Okay. What was Balaam's error? All right. So let's 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 get back to where I I'm not sure. So he said, okay, get back. So he says, don't go, don't, come on. You, you got to turn back, but Balaam would not listen, okay? Uh, he says, uh, your way is perverse. Your way is contrary to acceptable behavior. All of that, come on. You're going in a different direction the way I want you to go. This was the this was Balaam's problem. You're going contrary to where I want you to go. I am putting a sword. I am sending a donkey to speak to you. I'm taking you in the supernatural. Can you not hear me? Saints, this is the angel of the Lord. This is pre-incarnate Christ talking. This is 34 and 35. Let's go, Pastor. Okay, so we hear uh, verses 34, 35. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Did you hear that? Now, therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. Is this not the same one who said, no, no, you cannot go? Then the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, ha, go with the men, but only the word that I speak to you, that you shall speak. What did Balaam do? Balaam went with the princes of Balak. Did the angel of the Lord want to say that? Was it his will? Was it his intention to say that? Can I say something to you right now? Balaam says, I have sinned. How many of us want to say I have sinned? I have sinned. I have sinned. I have done wrong. I have gone against you, Lord. Come on. But then he says what? For I did not know. You stood in the way against me. Balaam, who was the one who was the prophet, did not know it was the angel of the Lord speaking. He did not know. Some of us, some of us have elders and no, let me not go there. Some of us have senior people, and the senior people don't even know what God is actually saying. It is the simple folk in the church who can see better. It is the simple folk in the church who can discern better what's really going on. 
And Balaam says, now therefore, if it displeases you, in other words, in other words, he just once again exposed his compromise. In other words, the confession was not a genuine confession. It was literally God, a, a, a real sorry, but come now, God, let me be able to do this thing. Now, please, God, oh gosh, you know, well, you know, if, only if you tell me, then I will, okay, okay, God, if you tell me, then I will turn back, okay? And here's what the angel of the Lord says. The angel of the Lord listened, and the angel of the Lord spoke, responded out of the idol of Balaam's heart, and said, you know what? Go. Not perfect will. He said, go. And I want us to understand. Balaam went on in defiance. Be careful. If God is speaking to you and it appears as though God changed his mind on a matter. Oh, God told me one thing, you know, but then God come back and told me something else. You know how many people told me? Listen, listen. I know, I don't know what's going to happen tonight, but oh gosh, we'll see how we can finish. People have said to me, God told me I'm supposed to be at this assembly. I'm supposed to be under you, prophet. I'm supposed to be training. You're supposed to train me and teach me. And then a month after, a month after, oh, you know, prophet, I think God has spoken to me and told me to go in a different direction. Can I tell you something? God does not change his mind. We change our mind and we believe it is God. Amen? God, what God does, God says, okay, you really wanna go on your own path? You go on your own path. Verse 34 and 35. We, we just read there, right? Oh, in verse 34 and 35, I want you to turn, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2. Let's go to this quickly. 2 Peter chapter 2. You can, you can write it down for me. Verse 15 and 16. Right. So it says they have forsaken the right way and gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity, a dumb donkey. And that word dumb is not a, a Trinidad term dumb. You know, it, 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 simply means, it simply means that a simple, it means the word simple, okay? Which is, which is actually not a negative word. Okay, saints, it's not used in the negative. Speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. Do you know, do you know Peter saw the actions of the prophet Balaam as being one of madness? His actions as being one of a madness because he chose to go against the way of God and followed the way of his own heart. His own heart superseded the way of God. And so that action, according to Peter, was a uh, madness to him. So the root of Balaam's sin was the love for money. Go to Jude chapter 1. I mean, Jude verse 11, it's all chapter one, right? The root of Balaam's sin was the love for, for money. Because when we look at it here, it says, woe to them. And the, the second part says, they have run greedily in the era of Balaam for profit. Now we are trying to find out here what was Balaam's error. Remember that. They have run greedily in the era of Balaam for profit. Okay. Now, in the, 
in what we read just now, we saw God saying, uh, the angel of the Lord saying, go with the men in response to the madness of Balaam's heart and Balaam's own sinful desire. Saints, God did not once again change his mind. Because of Balaam, what did he do? He hardened his heart. So what did God do? God sent Balaam, unfortunately, onto the path of judgment. Saints, when we disobey God, when God speaks to us, and we pursue a matter, and God says, whether it is through a prophet or whether it's through God directly speaking to us, and God says, okay, you really want to migrate when I told you stay here in Trinidad for a while until, until I say go, but you really want to push to go and you're pushing whatever you want to do to go. Listen, okay, I'm going to release it and I'm going to, I'm going to allow you to go. And I want us to understand, we have now opened the door for the path of judgment. When God says, I have put you here and I've put you here to stay for a reason, for a reason. Amen? Verse 36 to 41, quickly. We are back on numbers. And I want, when I'm speaking, for you to write as much as possible. Please um, don't even look at me. You just write. Those of you who could write, Bernadette, I know your situation, but the rest of you, please try to write. Okay? Don't just look. Write. Now, when Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab, which is on the border of Anand, the boundary of the territory. And Balak said to Balaam, did I not earnestly send to you calling for you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? And Balaam said to Balak, look, I have come to you. Now, have I any power at all to say anything? And the word that God puts, the word that God puts in my mouth that I must speak. So Balaam went to Balak and they came to Kirjah to Zoth, which is not an, it's an unknown place. Then Balak offered oxen and sheep. What did he do? Offer oxen and sheep and he sent some to Balaam and to the princes who were with him. Balak, the ungodly man, the ungodly king, offered oxen and sheep and sent it to the so-called prophet and to the princes who were with him. And so it was the next day that Balak took Balaam and brought him up to the high places of Baal, that from there he might observe the extent of the people. He might look at them and from, you know, from that vantage point, he can prophesy the things that Balak wanted him to prophesy. Can I not, can I not honor you? Can I not give you much more, you know, than, than just a diviner's, a, a diviner's offering? And that was like, whoa, Balaam is thinking, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Oh my goodness. So Balak, you know, said to Balaam, uh, took him up to the high places of Baal and offered him a sacrifice. And I want us to understand that, that it was the whole point of it was for Balaam to curse, Balaam to curse God's people. Please understand and listen carefully. Was this story just about Balaam? wanting money was it about him wanting money i think so far in the story it seems so but was it more to the story because the word that god puts in my mouth he said that i will speak sounds really good but could i say something to us he did not have to say that because god already had put the words from before now God is going to put some different words in his mouth. We have to look and see what is going to happen. Now in chapter 23, chapter, in chapter 23, I'm going to go faster in the story in chapter 23, but we are going to, we are going to look at it from a different perspective here. We are going to go, and I'm just going to, let me just quickly read this. And Balaam said to Balak, build seven altars for me here, 
prepare for me here seven bowls and seven rounds. Are you seeing the, the, the number seven being a number of, perfect, of, of, of perfection? And Balak, just as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam offered, hold on, hold on, hold on. Balak, they just as Balaam had spoken, and we're seeing Balak and Balaam. Balak and Balaam. Balak and Balaam offered a bull and ram offering on each altar. And Balaam said to Balak, stand by your burnt offering and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me and whatever he shows me, I will tell you. So he went to a desolate height. So Balaam very well, very well knew that God was not going to speak to him in that place where an unholy offering sacrifice was made. He very well knew that. He was appeasing Balak by doing the offering thing. And Balak had to, Balaam had to go to a different place to actually hear what God was actually saying to him. Let's go, let's, let's, let's see here. Does God speak here to find out? Does God, does God speak in this, in this realm? Does God speak out of that realm? Can God speak through the wicked? Can God speak to a wicked person? Can God speak through a wicked person? If God can speak through a wicked person, what does that say to us? I want us to ask those questions. I'm, I'm asking the questions to you right now. I'm asking you, listen carefully to me. Does God speak to a wicked person? Can God speak through a wicked person? And if God can, what does that say to us? Come on. Because in the case of this, what we are looking here, and we're going to read, I'm going to read verses for, I'm, 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 I'm presenting the question to you. We're going to answer it when we read verses four to six. So that you could now, you can now think about it. Can God speak through somebody who is wicked? Somebody who is not his? Let's go. Four to six. And I want you to think about it. And God met Balaam and said to him, and he said to him, that's Balaam said to God. God met him. I have prepared the seven altars and I have offered on each altar a bull and a ram. Did God request that? Did God ask for it? Did God want it? Did God, did God, did God, did God even want him there? Some of us want to give sacrificial offering. Some of us want to give offerings. Some of us want to appease God with a seed. And God says, I didn't even tell you to give that seed. I didn't even tell you to give that offering. And we think if we appease God with a seed, if we appease God with an offering, God will adhere to us. God will do whatever we ask. God will give us that wife, that husband. God will give us that money, that job. God will bless our job because we appease God with money. We are, who am I speaking to today? Balaam is telling God, I've prepared these altars. God is like, then God, then the Lord put his word in Balaam's mouth. Now hold on. God put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, return to Balaam and thus you shall speak. Do you know it is now, bow. It is now that God is now given an instruction. It is now that God is giving an instruction. It is now that God is speaking. Every other time that Balaam spoke before, and he said, the Lord had given me this, and the Lord had said that to me, and whatever. It was out of the carnality of Balaam, knowing what God would want. Knowing, knowing that God, 
God wants his people blessed, but it was not God actually speaking to him. It was Balaam speaking out of the carnality of his own thoughts. It is only now the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth. Was Balaam wicked? Yes, he was. Why was he wicked? Because we are going to discover that Balaam was wicked because Balaam did not only want money, but Balaam wanted to see the Israelites destroyed. He also did not like them. That's why he had fellowship with one called Balak. He says, return to Balak, thus you shall speak, God said. So he returned to him and there he was standing by his burnt offering, he and all the princes of Moab. Saints, can God speak to a wicked person? So he can. Does God only speak to us? Not at all. It shows us that spiritual gifts cannot possibly equal spiritual maturity, maturity in him. And I want you to note that. I want you to write that down. Spiritual gifts can never equal holiness and it can never equal spiritual maturity in Christ. Did you hear what I just said? And I don't know if you need me to write it down or if you can, you, because we want to go fast. I'm sure you can write that down yourself. For some of us, I want a spiritual gift. I want to see, I want to hear, I want to prophesy. I want to lay hands on the sick and nothing's wrong with it. As a matter of fact, we need it in this season. But if our, if our desire it's just to have spiritual gifts. If it's what we want more than anything, it says desire gifts. It's not saying not desire it. But if it is all that we want more than anything else, it can never equal spiritual maturity because we can have the gift and be wicked in our hearts towards our brothers and our sisters. Wicked in our hearts, we want to pull them down. We want to destroy that one. And let me tell you something. It is something that is going to be exposed. God will expose it. Spiritual gifts cannot equal holiness. It does not equal holiness. Don't think because you see somebody all filled with gifts. It means that they're holy. It means that God is pleased with them. It means that God honors them. It means even that God is in agreement with them. It doesn't even mean that. This is where we have to know the word of God. This is where we have to understand the heart of God and the compassion of Christ. When Balaam returned, Balak and all the princes and the Moabs, everybody was ready there and they were with their money ready to give Balaam. Okay, verses 7 and to 10. Verses 7 to 10. I don't think I'm going to I'm going to go there. That is that is the or let me let me just pull it up quickly because I'm not seeing it clearly here. Verses 7. Because I need to go faster here. I need to close off. Yeah, okay. let me just say something out of it. And so he said, and he took up his oracle and said, so, so uh, you know, the oracle is prophetic discourse. What is an oracle? Prophetic discourse. He took up his, the prophetic discourse and he began to speak and he began to speak, you know, about uh, the people of God and how shall I curse whom God has not visited? How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not de denounced? And and he continues in you know in that direction, okay? And and so we are beginning to see an oracle. We are beginning to see uh, Balaam now being compelled 
by God to speak the words of God. And let me say this to you. And, and we need to understand something because he was supposed to release a curse. Remember, he's seeing the people from a distance. Uh, Bala carried him to a place, look at the people and release a curse. All right? Because God knew exactly what Balak wanted. Balak wanted a spiritual curse so that he could defeat them in the battle. Remember, Balak was smart. He wanted a spiritual deal with it, deal with it in the spirit. And then Balaam is saying, well, how can I curse God? Who can I curse whom God has not cursed? Balaam literally was responding to what was in Balak's heart. And let me say this to you. The effectiveness of a curse is up to the sovereignty of God. Oh, you didn't hear that. The effectiveness of a curse is up to the sovereignty of God. How do I know that? Romans chapter 9 verse 18 says, God has a mercy on whom he chooses. Come on. And he hardens the heart of who he wills. That is, that is, uh, that is the word of the Lord. God has mercy on who he wants to. He hardens the heart, that's the amplified, on who he wants to, Romans 9, uh, 18. And uh, so the effectiveness of a curse is up to the sovereignty of God. So if somebody looks to curse you, come on. The effectiveness of that curse will be up to the sovereignty of God. And I'm going to say that to you. Why? Because no curse is supposed to come near our dwelling. No curse is supposed to affect a child of God. We are supposed to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. We are supposed to be divinely protected by the blood of Jesus, the word of the Lord and the spirit of God. And so no curse is supposed to really affect us. But if a curse from somebody begins to infiltrate and begins to affect us, it is because of the sovereignty of God and there is something that God wants to teach us. Come on. Come on. Are you there with me? He says, let me die the death of righteousness and let my end be like this. How can you, saints, die a death of righteousness if you have not even lived a life of righteousness? That is what he says in the verse 10. Let me die the death of righteousness that I may end like this. Balaam is crazy. It's madness to want to die in righteousness if you have not lived your life in righteousness. And to live your life in righteousness speaks a living a life that is well pleasing to God in loving him and loving your neighbor as yourself. That is the life that we are called to live. When we come up against our brother and sister, when we come up against our neighbor, and, and I spoke about the neighbor on Sunday's message, you, you pull it up when you can. Let me move on. He says here, and Balak said to Balaam, what have you done to me? I took you, I told, I took you to curse my enemies. And look, you have blessed them bountifully. And so he answered and said, Must I not take ye to speak what the Lord has put in my mouth? He sung them so very holy. Oh my God, I, I need to do this. Uh, after all, this is what God has said to me, and I must obey the Lord. Let's go to the, let's go to 13, uh, 17 quickly because it's more than that. It's more, it's more, it's more. Because he says here, then Balak said to him, please come. What did Balak say? Please come with me to another place. What is he saying? Okay, this location is not going to work. I'm going to move you and I'm going to set you somewhere else. And from which you may see me, you may see them. Come on, and you, sh and you shall see only the outer part of them. You shall not see them uh, uh, all at all. Curse, sorry, you shall not see them all. 
thirst them for me from here. So he brought them to the field of Zophim to the top of this place and built seven altars and offered them all that, all that, that on the altar. Verse 15, and he, and he said to Bela, stand here by your burnt offering while I meet the Lord over there once again. He's by an offering, but he can't stay there. He has to go across by somewhere else. Come on. And the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, go back to Balak and thus you shall speak. So he came to him and there he was standing by his burnt offering. Princes were there with him. And Balak said to him, what has the Lord spoken? Now, saints, do you know what that is about? We are, can you, can you face, because you shall not see them at all. In other words, so many times we want to deal with a matter with somebody, but we send them a WhatsApp. We cannot come face to face with them. You know, many people I know, they want to deal with me concerning something, but they will never come to my face to speak to me and meet with me. How many of you had that experience? They will not come and meet you. They don't want to look into your eyes to tell you what is in the carnal mind, what they want to say to you. And so they send you a WhatsApp. So Balak sends him to a place further away. So maybe if he goes further away from the people, it'll be easier for him to curse them. Come on. Are you there with me? Amen. So it was important to see the object of the curse. That historically, since when a prophet in that time had to release a curse, it was important for them to see the object of the curse. That was, that was a, a, a cultural thing. So he said, so instead he says, maybe if you go further away, then it will help you to release this curse. So he was telling him to go to move against the culture of the day. Amen? Okay, now, uh, he had not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen the wickedness of Israel. You see, saints, there is something that I want to speak about here. Actually, let me go down to verse 18. I'll just pull it down because I, I, we need to go fast, and I'll, I will say what I have to say from verse 18. So if we look here, and Balaam is now speaking, the oracle of God again. Rise up, Balaam, and hear. Listen to me, son of Zipporah. God is not a man. Full stop. <laughs> it should be that he should lie. Nor a son of a man that he should repent. He has a said. And will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? You see, as we go along in verse 21, he says, he has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen a wickedness. That word iniquity is trouble. He didn't see trouble. That word wickedness is perverseness. He didn't see perverseness. God was, is not seeing the sin, we, we keep looking at the sin in our own lives. God is not looking in that direction. God wants to see the goodness in us. So that's, that's the thing. We keep looking in that, that way and, 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 and that's where God wants us to get, not get. God said here, he says, I'm not looking at the of iniquity in Jacob. I'm not looking at the wickedness of, of Israel. That's not where I'm, I'm looking. Come on, saints. Okay. Now I need to let's 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 go down. Um, let's go down a bit. He says, "Go go down. Uh, stay right there and go down because I didn't. I don't think I dealt with the ox. Scroll down and tell me if I am seeing there. The ox." So he's referring to animals. There is no sorcery. Now look at this. 
There is no sorcery, verse 23, if you're there. There is no sorcery against Jacob, nor any divination against Israel. Come on, can we praise the Lord? Hold on right there. Don't do anything else. That's it. It ends right there. It ends right there. For there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor any divination against, against uh, uh, Israel. There is no curse, no curse from any occult practice shall come nigh us. It shall not come near our dwelling. As a matter of fact, sorcery does not work on God's people is what he's saying. Sorcery. Why is he saying that? Because that's what Balaam was using all the time. Before it was not God's words, really. It was sorcery. Sorcery does not work on God's people. Full stop. I don't care who did your obia. I don't care who did your puja. I don't care what hoax, what curse, what hex, what spell, what charm. The only way it will be allowed to affect you. It's if you yourself open the door to any area of sin and the sovereignty of God comes in to allow something to take place in your life to teach you a lesson. Oh, are we there? Are we there? Amen. Verse 25 and 26. Verse 25 and 26. Leave it, leave it on there. And Balak said to Balaam, neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. Balaam answered and said to Balak, did I not tell you, saying, all that the Lord speaks that I must do? All that the Lord speaks, he will never say, I am telling you I'm not to do this. I am telling you I'm not going in that direction. Balaam's third prophecy. Please come, I will take you to another place. Perhaps it will please God that you may curse me from there. So we go three times, three times to three different places. And Balaam took him uh, that overlooks the wasteland. And Balaam said to Balaam, again build so we are seeing three times three times on three occasions the same thing and the same and offerings happening every single time let's go to numbers chapter 24 we end in numbers chapter 24. So in Numbers chapter 24, it says, Now when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, hold on. When Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, did he not know that before? He did not go as at other times. He did not go as at other times to seek to use sorcery but he set his face toward the wilderness and Balaam raised his eyes and saw Israel encamped according to their tribes and the spirit of God came upon him now this at this point at this point Balaam realized he saw that it pleased the Lord to bless bless israel he says you know what i can't handle this anymore there's absolutely nothing at this stage that i can do nothing so he says how lovely are your tents oh god verse five how lovely are your tents oh jacob verses three going all the way to verse 9, speaks of a term that is used in the Bible 
that comes upon men of God at times called a spiritual ecstasy. It happened to the 70 elders in the time of Moses. So verses 3 through to 9 speaks of spiritual ecstasy. In other words, Balaam did not agree. He did not, Balaam himself did not agree with this. It was something that the Lord just came upon him. The Spirit of God came upon him and he did not even have the option. He had to release these words. He had to release these words. Okay? Blessed is he who blesses you. As, blessed is he who blesses you and cursed is he who curses you. Each one of the first three prophecies had gotten worse. If you notice that, for Bela, every time it was getting worse and worse. First, it was cursing. Uh, Balaam uh, failed to curse Israel. Then he failed. Uh, he blesses Israel. Then now he's going to come now to curse Balak himself. Because when we read it, we are seeing God, the king shall be higher than Agag and the kingdom shall be exalted. So we are seeing where he is speaking now against the Amalekites because Agag speaks of the Amalekites. You would, re you would remember uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, right? Where King Saul uh, had to defeat the Amalekites and King Agag, kill Agag, he did not. God brings him out of Egypt, the strength. He has the strength like a wild ox. And you are seeing where, and, and I wish I could go into, you know, a, a lot of detail into this because there really is a lot into this. I, I, I don't have the time to, but basically what he is saying, uh, basically in verse, this, these whole verses here, he is saying, how much worse can it get for this king of Moab? How much worse can it get? And so we are going down now to verses 10 through to 13. Because Balaam is actually prophesying destruction of the Moabites. That's what he's doing. He's actually cursing the Moabites. And he didn't even, and, and you know, he doesn't even realize that, that, that that's what's going on there. That whole part before there is Balaam cursing the Moabites. That which, that which the king of, that Balak wanted is going to turn around against him. Verse 10, and Balak's anger arose against Balaam. And he struck his hands together and Balak said to Balaam, I call you to curse my enemies and look, you have bountifully blessed them these three times. Now, therefore, flee to your place I said I would greatly honor you, but in fact, the Lord has kept you back from honor. Now, before I go any further, you have to understand, Elam at this point is probably about to get a heart attack because he's, he is freaking out. He says, he's thinking all this work that I have been doing all this time to try and get this money from this king, all this time it's not working. The man looks as though he's leaving. So Balaam, verse 12, Balaam says to Balaam, did I not also speak to your messengers whom you sent to me saying, if Balak were to give me, <laughs> if Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord to do good or bad for my own will. What the Lord says that I must speak. And now indeed I am going to my people Come, I will advise you what these people will do to your people in the latter days. Saints, oh my goodness, do you understand? Do you understand what is happening there? He realized he had to remind Bela of the idol of his heart. That's what's going on. So this is why he drew reference to it again. He says, you know what? Did I not tell you, tell the messengers, if you give me a house full of silver or gold, because guess what? Balak apparently forgot about the house full of silver and gold. And he says, listen, if you, if you take me there, then 
you know, you know, I will not do this. No. But what did he do? He reminded Bela that there is something that he can do that may cause Bela to actually go against the wishes of God. Amen. Saints. What is he saying? You know, before that, he says, I will greatly honor you. But in fact, the Lord has kept back my honor. The Lord has kept back from honoring you. And Balak said that he's not going to pay. Now, remember this. Huh? I want you to remember. Balak says, you see me? I'm finished. This man is a fool. I'm not going to pay Balaam. Because Balaam would not curse Israel. And, and so this, this is the end. I'm finished with you. So Balaam is like, wait, 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 God, hey, what is really going on here? I obeyed you, God. I you, you gave me instructions. I, I did the instructions. I actually said what you wanted me to say to the people. So where now is my blessing? Where is my monetary gain? Come on. I was before you, Lord. I did this for you, Lord. I did that for you, Lord. How come now, Lord, I'm not being blessed concerning the matter? I was faithful to you. My God, I, even when the COVID-19 was going on, I, I kept on in the programs when they kept coming on. I tried to pray. I tried to read the scripture. I was faithful to you, Lord. Yet what is happening now? Where is my blessing, Lord? How come I am not receiving blessing and I'm seeing other people being blessed right now? Do you understand? I don't get it, Lord. And this is exactly what was going on with Balaam. Balaam was like literally, this is why he drew reference to the silver and the gold because he's saying wait i need to get back my, i need to get my picture i need i work so hard pretending i'm obeying god pretending i'm honoring the lord you know i'm obeying his instructions and i need my returns now it was an issue in his heart Vince. It was compromise. So, the last prophecy, verse 14. Let's go, let's keep going. Let's end here. Because let me answer the question. And now, indeed, I'm going to my people. Come, I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the latter days. So what Balaam does here is he was compelled in the fourth prophecy, in the fourth oracle, because there were four, he was compelled to actually give a prophetic uh, uh, word on what was going to happen to, to those people and to all the people around. He literally gave predictive prophecy, okay? And I'm going to my people. There was no preparation here needed for this. Balaam was not going to pay attention to Balaam. Balaam was giving this. Balak was not listening. Actually, at this point, Balak was just not listening to him. But Balak was compelled still to give this prophecy. Literally, it, it would be considered a free prophecy because he felt as though, you know, Balaam, Balak was not going to pay him for this. But he, I have to tell you what, what is going to happen in the last days. Okay? Now, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star. Who's the star? Well, in the, in the natural, the star is first Jacob. Sorry, in the natural, the star is first David. But the star, capital S, is of course Jesus. Shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. Jesus and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of tumult. Now I want us to understand here we are seeing clearly, clearly, clearly that is a prophetic word of the destruction of Moab and Edom shall be a possession, Monsir, his enemies. And so what he is doing here, and then again, he spoke about Amalek. You see the Amalekite. Amalekite was uh, with the king Agag. He goes on, he's seeing here below, and he says in verse 21, 
and your firm is your dwelling place and your nest is set on the rock. Nevertheless, Cain shall be burnt. And let me just give you a little thing here. The word nest is Cain, um, just as the word Cain meaning from the Kenites. Okay, so there's a play on words there. Uh, the Kenites were originally friends of, 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 you know, the children of God. But what he's doing here, he's literally giving a prophetic oracle of what is to come. And I want us to understand that Balaam appears even here. Oh my goodness, well, he has to be a true prophet. He is speaking things that are actually going to come to pass. He is saints. He spoke about the neighboring, the neighboring people. He spoke about Moab. He spoke about Enoch. He spoke about Amalek, the Amalekites, the Kenites. All that is going to happen. But then, verse 25. Balaam rose and departed and returned to his place. Balak also went his way. What are we seeing at the end of that? What does that end say to us? Well, I'll tell you one of the things it says to us. It appears as though Balaam got through. It appears as though nothing happened. It appears as though Balaam just went his way. It appears as though Balak went his way. And there were no consequences for Balaam. Balak did what he has to do. But I want us to understand something. And this is something, you know, you know that, that, I, that I wrote down. And, and this is something we have to understand very clearly. Both were disappointed. Both were angry. Because both didn't initially, you know, get their own way. Balak wanted Israel defeated. He didn't get through. Balak, Balaam wanted Balak's money, but he didn't get that either. Balaam also wanted to curse Israel. That didn't happen either. So they both went their own way. You know something? I'm going to say this to us. Because there was something that the Spirit of the Lord said to me. Right after that last oracle, where they were going to be blessed, the, the third and the fourth oracle of the blessing, the people of God, verse chapter 20, uh, sorry, uh, the next chapter in Numbers, chapter 25, verse 1 only, only verse 1, you're going to see something. chapter 25. You're going to see this. Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. Verse 2, they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined with Baal to Baal of Peor. Do you remember? And the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. What, what, is that, what does that mean? There will always be a test just after a prophetic word of blessing. Let me write that down. There will always be a test just after a prophetic word. Write this down and always remember it, saints. For your whole life, remember this. There will always and i'm closing with this because you need to know this <clears throat> be a test just after a prophetic word of blessing if you receive a prophetic word that you're going to be blessed if you receive that, there will be a test right after that prophetic word. Revelation chapter 2 verse 14. So what was the doctrine of Balaam? What was Balaam's error? 
Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. Because this is why we are here. We need to get to the answer. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14 says this. But I have a few things against you because, because you have there are those who hold the doctrine of a Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Since the children of Israel, whom Balaam blessed just before, whom Balak did not get through with do you know because of because balaam didn't get through by the explosion of outward prophetic uh, uh you know curses and that didn't work instead he tried an implosion he tried a back door work the front door didn't work in the curse so he tried to curse them in the back door by influencing them in their area of weakness. He sent the Moabites and the Midianites, the women, to tempt the men of Israel. Saints, 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 are you getting this? Are you getting this? That is the problem. And what did he do? He tempted them uh, to sacrifice, to eat things, sacrifice to idols, and to commit the sexual immorality. The doctrine of a Balaam, of these false teachers, uh, they are going to cause you. It's not even so much an, a, a, a prophetic curse. They probably will never do a prophetic curse, but they will subtly speak to other people to influence you to go against the perfect why it is you going to that church boy why why it is you doing that boy why, why you don't come out this way why don't you go and do that and they will influence you uh, why don't you just do a little sin a little leaven come on how many of you know a little leaven leaven is the whole lamb come on that is what they are for is balaam's error what was his what was the end of balaam anyway numbers i'm not going to go to it but numbers chapter 31 uh, verse 8 gives you uh, Balaam's uh, death. Ba the Bible says in Numbers 31 verse 8 that Balaam was destroyed. Okay, it, he was absolutely destroyed. All right, but let me ask you, what therefore, answer me, what was Balaam's error? What was Balaam's error? I'm giving you one minute to answer, then I'm going to write it down and we're closing. What was Balaam's error? The doctrine was a doctrine, as we understand, of the false teachers. What was Balaam's error? Compromise. Yes. Anybody else? What was Balaam's error? Okay. Read. Idol worship. Self-centeredness, self-promotion. What was Balaam's error? Because we have to get to the root of it. After speaking for what? Two and a half hours. After the whole teaching. Because we understand so much so far. Disobedience, power. Disobedience to God's word. Okay, I'm, listening. I'm, reading, what, I'm reading what everybody's saying. Disobedience power. He didn't deal with the idol of his heart. Absolutely, he didn't. Let's go. Let's write it down. I want you to write down what I'm saying. What was Balaam's error? That we never find ourselves there. Let's erase. Can we erase some things so that I could write? It's a lot. I need some space. Right. That's that's right. Elam Zara. Start writing with me. Elam's error is such. 
willingness and persistence. Compromise for greed. And when I speak about greed, I speak about one money. I speak about sexual gratification. When I speak about greed, I'm speaking about personal satisfaction. When I speak about greed, I'm speaking about popularity. Always, it's popularity. Okay. The doctrine of Balaam is the doctrine of seduction for monetary gain. It encourages others as well. And those who follow after Balaam his error and his doctrine tend to act like an unbeliever. I want you to write that down because it was not just, his error was not just his willingness, but his persistence. Balaam persisted until he was able to get the children of God away from their purpose. Did he succeed? Would you believe the answer is yes? He succeeded. Even though in the natural, he was not able to curse. Even though uh, in the natural, he was not able to, to get through with what Balak asked him, asked him to do. At the end of the day, he so destroyed, he so disliked the people of God that he went to that level of, of not just uh, uh, an explosion, but an implosion. He allowed the external factors to affect them. In other words, the people around affected the children of God. The Moabites, the Midianites began, they began to be influenced. That was not happening before since. And it was not even a prophetic word. He just influenced them. Saints. That is the wickedness of Balaam. Balaam was wicked because he would persist until he got what he wanted and the love of money is the root of all even and understand the whole thing with Balaam it was the bottom line was financial gain it was about financial gain and if I didn't get my money this was his point I didn't get my money and because I didn't get my money I will destroy them and I know it will hurt God. So was Balaam a true prophet or was Balaam a false prophet? Well, our answer is made clear. Balaam was a false prophet. Could Balaam hear the voice of God? Yes. 
did did King Cyrus was was he not influenced by God when he said that God's people could come back and rebuild their temple and and so forth? Yes, he didn't know God, but we have to understand Jethro, Moses's uh, uh, father-in-law, did not know God, but he counseled him according to the ways of God. There are times when they're wicked people and they hear from God, it doesn't mean they belong to God. And many times we find ourselves in that place where we have to decide. Decide. Because I remember writing in the, in, 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 uh, and you would have had it in, in your book, School of the Prophets, level two. We must look at the character of the person and their conduct amen and saints if we if we are not able to get there the person is a, if we are seeing signs if we are seeing signs the person is a false prophet and the signs would be that they are not walking in love compassion to the people of god that's the telling sign of all telling signs if they are not walking in compassion to the people of God. They are false prophets. Amen. There will always be a test just after a prophetic word of blessing. Don't ever forget that. Amen. So, thank you.